Let's Green listen Jack. in. Council identify themselves starting with the Commonwealth. Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Lally. Good morning, Your Honor. Laura McLaughlin for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Ms. McLaughlin. Good morning, Your Honor. Alan Jackson on behalf of Ms. Reed. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Good morning, Elizabeth Little, also on behalf of Ms. Reed. Good morning, Ms. Little. Good morning, Your Honor. David Unetti for Karen Reed. Good morning, Mr. Unetti. Good morning, Ms. Reed. All right. So, to begin, and I have all the motions in limine. Um, I'll talk about how exactly we'll go through them in a minute. Um, but first, so in reviewing the motions in limine, I mean, clearly the defendant has an absolute right, a constitutional right, to present a third party culprit defense, but counsel is well aware that that is not without limit, right, from the case law. Now, the defendant has stood here, defense counsel has stood in this court repeatedly. Um, stood here and in other venues and in their pleadings espousing various third-party culprit um, theories or scenarios. Um, but now that it's time to actually try the case in the courtroom, I don't have a motion from the defense to admit third-party culprit. Uh, testimony. So, and as you're well aware, I have to make findings before any third part, any mention of any third party culprit evidence or even an opening goes before the jurors. Um, you know, in order to admit it, 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 given that I have no information at all, I mean, I don't know who the third party culprit is, even after reading 4,500 pages of discovery. I don't know what motive a third party culprit might have. I don't know how it's relevant. I don't know if it's remote or if it's current. I don't know if it's speculative um, or if it's relevant. I don't know if it will prejudice uh, or confuse the jury. And if it's hearsay, I have a whole other series of factors I have to consider. So, Mr. Yanetti, are you pursuing a third party culprit defense? Uh, we are, Your Honor, and I'm prepared to address that. The Commonwealth has raised the issue, and I am prepared to address that today. So so you filed your motions first and you did not raise it. So if the Commonwealth had not raised it, you did not move to introduce it, correct? I have no motion from No, I from understand. You about it. I understand, Your Honor. Um, if you'd like something in writing for us, we can do that. I have a full argument prepared. All right, so who is the third party culprit? We are under no obligation to name any specific third party culprit. How am I supposed to? So you're prepared to argue all this? I'm prepared to argue it, Judge. All right, so we will get to that when we get to the Commonwealth's motion. That's fine. Now, the, the second thing I want to address, because again, it's, it's very important at this point. Um, the motion regarding the DNA, regarding um, excluding the DNA. Mr. Lally, why should I not allow that motion? Uh, for a couple of reasons, Your Honor. Um, number one, uh, what I can uh, provide to the court by way of update is um, that most of the testing uh, with regard to that item is complete. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, the item is is hair uh, that was confirmed by the, the Bodhi uh, testing uh, prior to them conducting any sort of mitochondrial testing. The mitochondrial profile, uh, the partial profile that was generated in regard to the hair sample uh, is complete. The mitochondrial DNA profile in regard to Mr. O'Keefe's sample is complete. Uh, the preliminary analysis uh, that I received uh, by way of uh, email from Bodhi yesterday uh, indicated that they were consistent with each other. Uh, I asked for some sort of preliminary report or something that I could share with the council uh, based on their uh, labs accreditation. Uh, that does not permit them to release anything by way of a report prior to it going through a full review process. My understanding is that not only that process, but the entire uh, lab file uh, should be produced uh, by Tuesday. On top of that, uh, what I would uh, state as far as any sort of prejudice uh, to the defendant of yours that they've 
suffered as a result of that. Uh, there is still zero reciprocal discovery that I've received uh, in regard to anything from counsel. And then part of the delay, at least a portion of uh, the delay in this specific testing, as the court is aware, uh, as you've had a chance to review uh, Bodhi Technologies uh, observance policy as far as outside experts, there was a significant delay in hearing from counsel and uh, for the defendant in regard to whether or not they wish to have someone present prior. How long a delay? I uh, believe it was at least several weeks, if not a month. I mean, we spoke about it in person in December, uh, and I don't believe that My I... My order was in November. Correct. So when we received uh, the... It was, took a... Your order was in November. What took a little time on our part was to get uh, the samples taken from the troopers in regard to the other testing and in order to get all of those items shipped and transported from the MSPCL to Lorton, Virginia, to Bodie. When was that done? Uh, late November. Go ahead. Then there was uh, a evidence viewing, uh, which both counsel uh, attended. We spoke about it there. I think that was December 1st. Uh, and then I waited a few weeks, never heard back, followed up on it, and eventually heard uh, back with regard to them not wishing to have anybody present for that. When was that? I, I don't have a specific date offhand, but... I need you to find it. I can. All right. So I didn't know that the defendant decided not to have somebody there. Right. And that prolonged it. They weren't able to go forward, right? Yes. How long will it take you to find that information? Um, shouldn't take too long. I just, I, I would need to check my email. All right, I'm going to take a five minute recess. Thank you. You are muted. Right now on CBS News, Boston, Karen Reed's murder trial just days away. Why arguments from both sides say there could be a delay, but we just listened in to the beginning part of this trial. One of the big questions here is Reed's right to a third party culprit defense. The judge saying it is well within Karen Reed's constitutional right. We are going to continue to stick with this, so be sure to stay with WBZ and CBS News Boston. Again, this just started. We are going to be following this all day long.
Okay, you want to tap into the best energy in the world? It is right here. Launch day for Project 351. Project 351 is a service organization for eighth graders in every city and town in Massachusetts. And these students commit to do service in their communities for one full year. What's up? Nice to see you. Great to see you. How you doing? And right now they're doing team building exercises and kind of getting to know each other because there's only one student here from each city and town. So most of these kids don't know each other. By the end of this year, they'll be like best friends. Each and every individual ambassador's hometown projects are making a huge difference. We work uh, to combat mental health issues, uh, clothing insecurity, food insecurity is obviously a really big thing. Just knowing that you made an impact in someone's life and it empowers me to be a better person. I love being part of the mission to help. You serve other people who are not as fortunate as you. We all really have this take care of each other mentality. It's learning how to be a better person. These are students who are saying we want to be part of the solutions in our community and we are willing to do the work. And this is where some of the service is taking place. We are under the Tobin Bridge right now at La Collaborativa. We have hundreds of people coming through this line, getting food from Project 351 Ambassadors. The need is great. I didn't realize how many people needed this help. We talk about food insecurity, but this is a next level understanding how big a problem this really is. It's really sad to see how many people in our community need food. This is the ultimate in community and shared humanity. Like I could do this all day. Feels good. Yeah. When we come to places like this and you can see hope in action, it really makes you know that something good is happening. I mean, as a news organization, we're always reporting on the problems. We're always pointing out that there are unmet needs in our community. And when you come here to Chelsea, you see people meeting those needs. When we talk about making a greater Boston, this is how it happens, and these are the young people doing it. Welcome back, everyone. Taking a look out. Side, you can see uh, quite a lot of traffic there getting into the city. And what's worse is we have a rough, wet, messy commute to boot, certainly impacting drivers out there. All that rain and fog, Jason, you can see over the Zacum. Let's get a check of our forecast because the good news is there is sun to be seen not too far away. Sun to be seen, warmer temperatures to be had, and a good a smile to wear as well. Maybe it doesn't happen for the first half of our Friday, but I think we also have a good chance of that smile happening for the rest of the afternoon heading into the evening hour. So let's break down the forecast, at least for the first half of our Friday. An additional quarter to a half inch of rain is a given. We can definitely expect that. We still do have some banding of showers moving through. It is roughly about 60 degrees right now. This is our music. Museum of Science cam. You can see there on Missignor O'Brien in downtown, but also with some lingering clouds in that lowered cloud deck, we've allowed our temperatures to stay relatively mild overnight tonight. So we're not waking up to around 40 degrees where we should be averaging for a morning low. Still with some fog draped across the north and south shore, one to two to three mile visibility. Inland areas also have some pockets of dense fog as well, with some breaks right in between, roughly around 95, around 60 degrees right now here in the city, 61 over in Bedford. 57 in Lawrence, 60 in Fitchburg, 60 also in Nashua and low 60s in Norwood. Around 60 degrees for our friends there in Plymouth. And again, as you get out towards the Cape, a little bit cooler there. Again, we should be averaging around 55 degrees, but because we have sort of a low level surge of warmer air at the surface, the mid and upper levels are pulling at a northwesterly breeze. So again, look at this. So at the surface and also the mid levels, that's when you have sort of a clash of air masses too. We typically see that once we get into the spring season and that equates to severe weather. We don't have any sort of threat like that happening today, but that's just an interesting nugget. Just sort of you keep on your brain, at least as we move forward into the springer season. All right, gusty winds expected mainly along the north and south shore, 40 to 50 mile per hour gusts. Even some areas along the Cape right now are approaching near 40 mile per hour gusts. Look at that Nantucket at 39, 41 over in Chatham, 29 in P-Town, 44 mile per hour gust right now in Taunton. Pair of threes you can see there in Plymouth and around a 40 mile per hour gust here in Boston. So hang on everybody. The warmer air is moving back in, but of because we're going to have this wraparound flow, we're just still going to be fetching in just a wee bit of moisture off of the South Bay there, and that's likely going to move inland between 195 and 495 and certainly north into the Merrimack Valley. That's where the warmer air is likely to remain. 7 p.m. There's the drier air, and it's just going to punch right on through the clouds, and that'll clear us out just for a moment. Do not wish to have observation for testing in the hair sample of Bodie. All right, so that was about a month after my order? Correct. All right. And the defendant's asking me to exclude this in part because of the late 
disclosure of the information. Yes. All right, uh, I'll hear from the defense on this, and then I'll give you an opportunity to address it, Mr. Lally. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. I'd first like to address the timeline that Mr. Lally has just explained to the court. First of all, we were not made aware that we were allowed to test based on Bodie's protocols and procedures until December 1st. We were given a letter saying it would cost $21,000 for our expert to sit in on that testing. We we reviewed that letter. We told Lally, that Mr. Lally that it was most likely we were not going to have someone independently watch the testing because of the price. When was that? December 1st. When? December 1st? On December 1st. Okay. We confirmed that in writing when he emailed us again on December 22nd. And I would note for the court that Bodhi did not receive the hair from the Commonwealth until January 11th. Okay. So there was no delay on our part. As the court knows, to date we have received no reports from the Commonwealth regarding Bodhi Technologies' analysis of the DNA. The Commonwealth has engaged in repeated and inexcusable delays regarding the testing of this particular item of evidence, which at this point is sanctionable. The hair has been in law enforcement custody for more than two years, Your Honor. On February 1st, 2022, Massachusetts State Police criminalist Maureen Hartnett purportedly recovered a hair from the bumper of Ms. Reed's vehicle. For a full year, the Commonwealth did nothing. Finally, on March 6, 2023, criminalist Marine Hartnett got around for the first time. Sorry, criminalist department? Is that what you said? Criminalist Maureen Hartnett. Okay, yes. Got around to conducting a visual inspection of that hair for the very first time. On March 6, 2023, she opined that it appeared to be human. However, subsequent discovery produced by the Commonwealth revealed that she had failed her proficiency test in that precise subject matter only one month prior. Then, on August 25th, 2023, the Commonwealth submitted that hair to the Massachusetts State Police Lab for DNA testing, and it was forensically determined that no human DNA was detected. Almost six months later, the Commonwealth made their third attempt to find evidence establishing that the hair was somehow probative in this case. It is now four days before trial, and we are told that we're going to receive this on the day trial is set to begin. Pursuant to Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 14C, subdivisions one and two, the court has the discretion to exclude evidence based on the Commonwealth's failure to comply with its discovery obligations. There's no excuse for a two-year delay. We immediately conferred with counsel when he notified us as to what the requirements were going to be if we decided to have an expert present for testing. We got back to him the day that he emailed us following up about that. And they didn't even bother sending the hair to the lab until weeks later. So I don't think it's fair to blame the defense for a two-year delay in this regard. As the court may know from the notices of discovery, we've received an overwhelming amount of evidence. This week, last week, the week before that, we're on the eve of trial. It is not fair to throw at us yet another item of evidence that we have to retain an expert to assess. We have to review, we have to make tactical decisions. That's not a fair position to put the defense in. We've been asking for a continuance. I think the only fair thing if the court is going to force us to go to trial is to exclude this evidence. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Lally? Yes, Your Honor. Again, um, it, not faulting counsel for any sort of two-year delay period, but there was a, a period of time, uh, given sort of the close nature of, of when the Commonwealth is receiving this information, uh, that a couple weeks, uh, or a few weeks in this case, uh, do matter. Uh, the other point uh, I would make as far as, uh, again, as far as the defendant being prejudiced, this is an evidence that I anticipate introducing in, in the first day, the first week, or probably not even the first month of, of trial. So uh, whatever time counsel needs uh, in order to uh, 
retain an expert, run that by an expert, run that by one of their experts they already have. Uh, I, I don't know that, whether or not they have any experts, because again, I don't have anything from them. Um, so as far as uh, ample time, uh, I, I would submit uh, that there's more than sufficient time uh, once the report is received uh, for counsel to make uh, use of it in whichever way they deem appropriate. Uh, and for that reason, and I'm certainly not asking the court to continue the trial date, uh, but for that reason I would ask that the motion to exclude be denied, um, absent any prejudice to the defendant. All right, so I, I'm going to take this under advisement. Uh, and I, I may as well tell you that the best way, I think, for us to proceed with the rest of these motions is since because they were filed so late, which I understand they were filed, just to be clear, I know they were filed by the deadlines, but uh, so close to trial, uh, I don't have written oppositions, really, unless you both raised uh, independently the same issue. So what I will do this morning is my intention is to hear um, from counsel to hear at least from the other side if um, if the motion itself is clear enough but to hear from counsel um, then we'll take a break and at two o'clock we'll come back and anything I can decide because I know you're preparing this weekend to go to trial on Tuesday anything I can decide by this afternoon I will anything that I cannot I will let you know um, and then um, then we'll do housekeeping, which I can, um, including, though it's certainly a very important part of the case, jury voir dire in that. So that will come at the end of, that will come this afternoon. So uh, starting with the view. Um, uh, Your Honor, I was just going to notify the court, uh, to your discretion, there are a number of motions that will be unopposed. I don't know if All right, you want so to. what I'm going to do with that is the Commonwealth filed a very helpful list of what they're um, numbers. We have, of course, the, the paper number, the docketed number. Uh, so when I get to that, we'll just go through those quickly. Whoever the court wishes. All right, I appreciate that. So, so you, <laughs> well, I'm probably starting with one. You could have saved yourselves time in writing the motion regarding the view because you both want a view. I will conduct a view. Um, you need to talk because you have different locations. Yeah, uh, and you know, we've, uh, upon consideration, Your Honor, the Commonwealth has asked for a view of 34 Fairview Road. Um, we would be satisfied with a view of so you don't need to go to the waterfall we, we, I, I think that we can just agree to go to that one location all right so you all figure out the view I am going to take under advisement your request um, of the defendant coming with us you know that there are all sorts of things I have to consider sure. before deciding that Thank okay you. so that part is under advisement um, before the end of today, figure out exactly what you want to do with the view. Um, Mr. Lally, your office will provide state police escort for that view? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Now, our court officers, Chief Rose usually gets the bus. So, all right. So, for that. So, the Defendant's motion, it's our paper 283. Defendant's motion eliminated to exclude irrelevant, inadmissible, and prejudicial prior bad character and propensity evidence. So I'll hear whoever's arguing that for the Commonwealth. The Aruba incident, if you will. I mean, I'm sorry, who, who's arguing for the defense? That's who I'll hear from. I am, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. Did you say 282? 283. 282. Oh, this is all backwards. Pauline did this for me. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hi. Your Honor. The Commonwealth seeks to admit irrelevant, inadmissible, and prejudicial prior bad character and propensity evidence against Ms. Reed by admitting inflammatory evidence of an event that purportedly transpired in Aruba on December 31st, 2021. As the court knows, this type of propensity evidence is extraordinarily prejudicial and serves no purpose other than to assassinate Ms. Reed's character in the eyes of the jury. The Commonwealth has put forth no reliable evidence to suggest that the incident that occurred in Aruba on New Year's Eve has anything whatsoever to do with O'Keefe's death or that this remote and isolated incident was even a point of contention in their relationship at the time in question. And we aren't left guessing, Your Honor. All of the witnesses who were present at the Waterfall Bar and Grill on January 29, 2022, 
along with high quality video surveillance footage from that night, established that Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe were happy, they were in good spirits, they were getting along. There is no evidence to suggest that this incident had anything to do with the facts at issue in this case. The Commonwealth points to purported angry voicemails left on the, defendant's, the decedent's voicemail to suggest that there was some sort of hostile relationship between Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe that night. However, these voicemails were left after Ms. Reed dropped O'Keefe off at Brian Albert's residence and after he failed back to come back outside to meet her. There is no logical relationship between the prior bad acts evidence in this case that the Commonwealth seeks to admit and the crime charged here. And therefore, this evidence must be excluded. Okay, come on. Yes, Your Honor. So this also relates to uh, Commonwealth's motion to eliminate number 20. Yes. Um, so in regard to that, Your Honor, this is uh, highly relevant evidence as it pertains to motive and as it pertains to the nature of the relationship between Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed, uh, which uh, goes to motive, it goes to absence of accident, goes to motive, uh, ad, excuse me, absence of mistake. Uh, and this is not a, um, as the defendant seems to uh, continuously try to pose it as, as some sort of temporary or isolated uh, incident. This isn't just the argument uh, or the yelling uh, of swears between uh, the defendant and uh, Ms. Sullivan in the lobby in Aruba. This then leads to an argument which uh, both children indicate in their statements uh, continued inside the room in front of them for about 20 minutes after it happened. This is also not a fleeting reference in the sense that the defendant continuously brings it up on her own. Um, specifically in text communications uh, with Mr. Higgins uh, when she's talking about uh, the nature of their relationship. And it's not just the voicemails that the defendant leaves on Mr. O'Keefe's phone after uh, the murder occurs in front of 34 Fairview. It's also uh, text messages exchanged between the two of them in the days leading up to that uh, in which they discuss the nature of their relationship. You also have statements from the children which indicate that the victim had tried to break up with the defendant multiple times in front of them asked her to leave the home and she refused. You also have a text communication from Mr. O'Keefe to Ms. Reed in which he indicates that he thinks that their relationship is essentially... What was the course. date of that one? I believe that was the 28th. Uh, then there's an, other text messages uh, from the defendant to Mr. O'Keefe uh, referring to their relationship uh, as, between themselves and with the children as toxic. Um, these are further statements regarding infidelity which continue on to the morning of uh, in, in which statements that she makes uh, in the backseat of the vehicle with Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts as they're looking uh, for Mr. O'Keefe uh, just prior to, uh, to locating his body on the front lawn of 34 Verfew. Um, these are statements <coughs> regarding uh, her belief uh, of Mr. O'Keefe's infidelity that she repeats again when she's uh, having her recorded interview with Ms. Voss from Boston Magazine. Uh, these are not isolated statements. These are not uh, just one time four weeks prior. It's not too remote in time and it does show sort of the nature of the relationship and as it's evolving over the course of that month from the date of, of the incident in Aruba all the way through until the date uh, that Mr. O'Keefe uh, is killed. In furtherance of that also there are statements that the defendant makes to paramedics when she's being treated on scene uh, that the last time that she saw Mr. O'Keefe they got into a fight or an argument and she's upset because that's the last time that they spoke was during the course of a fight or an argument in front of the house on Fairview Road. Uh, so it literally continues from the Aruba incident all the way through uh, to the murder's occurrence. Uh, so for those reasons the Commonwealth would submit uh, that it is relevant as to motive, it is relevant as to absence of uh, accident and it is relevant as to absence of mistake. Thank you. All right. Um, what I will need is exactly what the Commonwealth intends to introduce. I think you've outlined it and I'm familiar with it. Um, if, if I admit it, it would certainly be accompanied by very strong curative instructions, which you know is my right. Uh, I've heard argument now. I'm going to think about this and maybe decided by this afternoon, but... Okay. Thank you. Okay.
All right, so you were both in agreement on what's the defendant's motion to exclude irrelevant and prejudicial evidence regarding alleged harassment and or intimidation of a witness and the Commonwealth's for different grounds and different scope actually. Motion to exclude mention of Aiden Kearney, AKA Turtle Boy and his pending criminal charges for witness intimidation. So though you both agree it's out, that doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with you that it should be out. Um, I understand that the nature of her the harassment um, mindful of the grand jury minutes that I've read that in response to some of the questions posed by uh, those at the U.S. Attorney's Office, the answers explained away some conduct as a result of the extraordinary harassment witnesses were undergoing. So I'm not sure I agree with you. So go ahead and, and try and persuade me, but um, what I'm inclined to do is keep it out in the case in chief, but uh, Kamala said you, you know, told your witnesses not to discuss it. So I'll I'll hear the defendant. I guess I would start, Your Honor, by saying that um, in order for evidence to come in, it has to be elicited by a party. It has to be offered by a party. Um, you're being told that the Commonwealth does not intend to elicit this evidence and that the defense does not intend to elicit this evidence. So I guess the question that I would direct to the court is, do you intend to follow up with questions? I'm not questioning the jury. It's clear that it may be a response, a natural response by a witness that neither one of you intended to get as a reason for something, right. that I'm not going to sanction the witness because I allowed the Commonwealth's motion. Sure. Uh, so, so, Mr. Yanetti, yes. so it's clearly you try your case the way you want to try your case, and the Commonwealth decides how they want to do it. But I am not tying the hands of witnesses to natural responses to questions. So I'm taking this under advisement. If you open the door, it comes in. Well, I completely understand that, Your Honor. Um, I, I will say that I think probably, I don't want to speak for Mr. Lally, but I think... So, so don't speak for Mr. Lally. I'll, I'll hear speak from him I'll in a minute. I'll speak for myself then, if the court will allow me, uh, which is that... Uh, if, if a, uh, a witness opens the door to uh, you know, a further explanation of this, um, that could give rise to both sides right. exploring that, which you know, I, I suppose uh, we'll deal with that when it comes, it comes right. to it. The way the motion's written, it would be prohibited, and witnesses, you know, I'm not tying the hands of witnesses to natural answers that are the result of questions asked by counsel. Right, understood. Okay. Do you understand that, Mr. Lally? Oh, absolutely, Your Honor. And, and that was not my intent. As, as if, if How the motion reads, Mr. Your motion reads, Mr. Lally. I understand. Uh, but it, it was more of a uh, notice that, that the Commonwealth doesn't seek to introduce any evidence of that. But at the same time, obviously, if the, the truthful and honest answer to a question that's posed of a witness references that, then, then I think it, it comes in. All right. So I think we're all on the same page. Neither of you intends to introduce this in your cases, but if you open the door, or if it's a natural response from a witness, it comes in. You okay? All right, so... Jim, is 289 defendant's motion eliminated to exclude the plasma, serum plasma, the blood, the alcohol testing, or are my numbers all off? That's 289. Yeah. All right. And, and the Commonwealth has a, a, a paragraph or two responding in one of your other motions. So I will hear the defendant on the motion regarding the testing of the blood from the hospital for the alcohol levels. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll be addressing this uh, with the court, with the court's permission. Um, this is number, just so we 
keep it clear in my head, I, I had named this number 17 dealing with the retrograde extrapolation. Okay, we don't have it as 17 anywhere. I thought that was the, the list that the, the helpful list that the Commonwealth. Oh, okay, so, it's, so the, I, right. uh, our number is 289. Right, okay, so. And the Commonwealth's one paragraph response is 17, but you filed the motion, so why don't we hear from you as the moving party? Thank you. Um, so the Commonwealth wishes to have Ms. Reed's retrograde extrapolation records admitted over naturally a hearsay objection because the Commonwealth, their position is that they are medical records. The Commonwealth misapprehends the definition, the base definition of what a medical record is. A medical record, as the court well knows, holds a very special place in the evidence code, and that's because it's not compiled in anticipation of litigation. And for that reason and that reason only, um, they're deemed non-testimonial and, and not subject to Crawford, uh, Crawford and the defendant's right to confront and cross-examine witnesses or the experts behind the reports. Medical records are different than what we have here. The extrapolation records we have here are not medical records that were generated for treatment or Ms. Reed's medical history. They're the opposite. Those records were generated specifically in anticipation of litigation and in association with this criminal investigation. Thus, they are rank hearsay. The Commonwealth claims that the records are not produced in anticipation of litigation, stating basically uh, that during her hospitalization, law enforcement was at the, quote, beginning stages of their investigation. Um, but what the Commonwealth fails to mention or address is that at approximately 6.30 a.m. on a dash cam video, an officer, Officer Good, as a matter of fact, a Canton police officer, states to Detective Lank that he is going to quote unquote section her, which the court knows what that phrase means. He's going to place a hold on her medically. Thus, the clear intent of law enforcement hours before the blood draw was actually taken was to keep her under law enforcement's thumb as she was an immediate suspect. But there's a bigger issue, Your Honor, and that is that the parties lack the essential both, and by the way, this goes to the Commonwealth as well, the Commonwealth, but more importantly, the defense, we all lack the essential information on how the blood was actually drawn and tested. Those standardized protocols that we all get used to in the average OUI case, drunk driving case, uh, they don't exist here. Uh, the standardized protocols for reliable testing, they're tried and true, and every one of those protocols is missing or are missing, and that leaves the defense having to sort of guess at the validity of the underlying test, and the validity of the underlying test is the foundation on which the extrapolation is made, which is the only thing the Commonwealth really cares about. They don't care about the underlying test, they care about extrapolating backward several hours. But that, this sort of goes along the, the, the theme of garbage in, garbage out. If the underlying test was not valid, or it can't be proven to be valid, then, of course, the extrapolation is also invalid. Uh, the question remaining is, was the testing done by gas chromatography? Was it enzymatic testing? We don't know and we'll never find out. We don't have reports to suggest that uh, or exactly what the validity of those tests were. So the initial result is suspect and by extension the extrapolation is also suspect. It, it bears pointing out, Your Honor, and this is the only sort of granular detail I want to get into, the extrapolation, according to the Commonwealth's expert, is somewhere between 0.13 and 0.29 blood alcohol concentration. That is a swing of more than 123%. In other words, the swing of the extrapolation is larger than any one of the numbers themselves, which means uh, it can't be, it, it simply cannot be reliable. It illustrates the invalidity of the underlying serum plasma test. And for those reasons, the defense objects to the admission of both the blood test, the underlying test, as well as the concomitant extrapolation. Thank okay, you. thank you. Come on.
Your Honor, so what the Commonwealth would submit is this may have been a valid ba basis for a motion to suppress, but it was a motion to, to suppress that was never filed and one that the defendant specifically waived, uh, that Mr. Yedetti waived all uh, motions to suppress. As it pertains to uh, Mr. Roberts from the Office of Alcohol Testing's testimony regarding the serum conversion and the retrograde extrapolation, the reason for the range is because it's math and essentially taking into account a number of uh, different variables. Uh, that is why the range is as it is. As it pertains to the um, the specific item that would be introduced into evidence, meaning the defendant's medical records, that's what the Commonwealth is referring to as the records uh, coming in. Mr. Roberts would come in and testify as to his own uh, analysis, his mathematical calculations, and the results based on his training and experience, which the defendant has had for over two years, as Mr. Roberts testified at the grand jury, to that exact uh, set of scenarios. As it pertains to the testing itself, the Commonwealth, uh, as indicated on its proposed final pretrial memorandum, has summoned then not only uh, the doctor who ordered the testing, the registered nurse, uh, the nurse practitioner, uh, who would both have been involved in the uh, taking of the sample from the defendant pursuant to uh, her medical treatment and medical diagnoses, as well as the director of the lab uh, at Good Samaritan Medical Center who would testify as to uh, what kind of testing is done and the nature of that testing and everything else. As it pertains to those witnesses, if the defendant wishes to conduct some sort of voir dire prior to the testimony in front of the jury, I certainly have no objection to that. Uh, but any sort of voir dire of Mr. Roberts or exclusion of his testimony uh, would be inappropriate based on the fact that uh, the defendant has had more than ample notice uh, as to what the parameters of that testimony would be. Uh, so as far as what would be coming in as an exhibit, uh, it would be the medical records with that uh, amount in it, and then it would be testimony from essentially anyone and everyone involved uh, in the ordering, taking, and analyzing uh, of that particular sample, which then provides the basis for Mr. Roberts' testimony. Okay. So I have like one small paragraph from the Commonwealth on this. I want a memo on this. Sure. All right. So I'll take this under advisement. M17. M17. Yeah, um, there's 17 we still need to address some of. <clears throat> all right. So that's all of the defendant's motions in limine, correct, Mr. Unetti? I mean, just have a moment. Mr. Jackson, it's all of them, isn't it? We, we, no, we, no we, we filed a motion for attorney-conducted panel of voir dire. Yeah, that's a joint motion, and that's I already said we're going to talk about impanelment this afternoon. Just being complete in answer to the court's question. That was okay. one that was not addressed, but that's fine. All right. Oh, the, the request just to have panel, your motion was a little bit confusing. Right. So you just, you want panel of voir dire? Panel of voir dire, correct. I, I'm not going to do panel of voir dire in this case. So we'll talk about the particulars of it um, later this afternoon. All right, so on the Commonwealth's list of motions, you said that there are some that you may agree with. What besides the view? Are there any of these numbers? Who's? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the defense does not object to the Commonwealth's motions in limiting numbers one through six. Um, number right, eight. One through six. Yes, number eight. Number nine. Number 11, we obviously joined in that request. Yes. Um, let's see. Number 14, we do not object to. Number 15, we have no objection in principle, but we, we do reserve the right to object to just individual exhibits as they, they come. Yeah. Uh, number 18, we have no objection. Number 19, we have no objection. Number 23, no objection. Number 26, no objection. I, I believe that's, the court that's did the one we addressed that. yet. And number 32, we have no objection. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Lally, I will hear you on our paper 297, your number seven. Okay. 
So, Your Honor, this is the Commonwealth's motion to preclude reference and redact the manner of death contained on the victim's death certificate. Uh, this is a, a routine motion uh, the Commonwealth files and and really respect to any case. Uh, manner of death. That's is, not persuasive. So go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I'm just it, manner of death uh, as as. Uh, elucidated in the motion is not something um, that is typically something uh, that is permissible to be testified to uh, from anybody to the jury because that's sort of the question of, of liability uh, ultimately that is left to their uh, discretion um, as far as how they find the facts but cause of death obviously is something that is a medical determination manner of death as the court is well aware is uh, there are essentially three or four different uh, selections and they fall into different categories they don't necessarily mean in the medical context uh, what they might mean in the legal context uh, so for that just sort of simple differentiation of, of meaning between the two uh, manner of death is not something that the Commonwealth feels is appropriate for the court uh, for any witness to be uh, testifying to uh, as far as the jury is concerned as that's a question uh, for them ultimately to determine. And for those reasons, the Commonwealth would ask that this motion be allowed. All right, who's responding to this? Thank you, Your Honor. The medical examiner who completed the death certificate in this case concluded that the manner of death was undetermined. The Commonwealth now seeks to have that portion of the death certificate redacted because it is quite clearly exculpatory. All of the cases cited by the Commonwealth deal with the issue of whether it was error for the Commonwealth to admit a death certificate listing the manner of death as a homicide because it violates a defendant's right to due process and a fair trial under the 5th, 16th, and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitutions. None of the cases cited by the Commonwealth stand for the proposition that a medical examiner's determination that the manner of death is undetermined should be redacted. In fact, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Ellis at 373 Mass 1, it's a 1977 case, for the proposition that excluding the word undetermined is the better and safer course. But that's a misstatement of the law, and I would urge the court to read the Supreme Judicial Court's opinion in that case. What it actually says is this, quote, nothing contained in the record of a death which has reference to the question of liability for causing death shall be admissible in evidence. The better and safer course is to exclude from a death certificate the words homicide, suicide, or accident in a criminal trial. Notably missing from that list of words that the Supreme Judicial Court warned about is the word undetermined. That is what the Commonwealth seeks to have redacted here. The Commonwealth bears the burden of proof in this case. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a homicide occurred, and their own medical examiner has opined that she was unable to make that determination. That finding is relevant, it's exculpatory, and there's no authority that supports its redaction. Thank you. All right, Ms. Delally, the medical examiner will be on your witness list, right? I haven't seen either of yours witness list. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, so I'll take this under advisement. All right, Ms. Sulali, your number 10, our number 300. Yes, Your Honor. In this motion, the Commonwealth is uh, simply seeking to uh, obtain Corey information or records of potential jurors, um, not looking for uh, information pertaining to uh, jurors that, as they come in, or some voluminous amount uh, of every possible potential juror, but only seated jurors. Um, and essentially, what the Commonwealth is requesting uh, is to uh, simply have some sort of verification that the answers that are provided by the jurors are uh, true and accurate. Um, this is something that is permitted by the case law, it's permitted by the statute, uh, and it's obviously something that the Commonwealth would share with the defense as required to, um, but the timing of it, of, of what I'm asking for, and the limited scope uh, that I'm asking for in relation to uh, just seated jurors once we have a full sort of uh, set of jurors, whether that be 12, 16, whatever the, whatever the court uh, chooses as far as the number, I'm, I'm assuming approximately 16 or so. Um, but once those are seated, the Commonwealth is just asking for some time to uh, to run those quarries and provide those uh, to counsel and then make any further objections uh, for cause prior to the jury being sworn. Okay. So I, I know you're not in agreement. Are you opposing this? Yes, Your Honor.
Your Honor, we object for several reasons. Uh, first, uh, the jurors are given a questionnaire which specifically asks this question. Um, they self-report. We rely on self-reporting from jurors with regard to all questions. The Commonwealth has cherry-picked this one question to verify whether or not they're telling the truth without dealing with any of the other questions that the jurors are asked. Um, this proceeding right now, like many of these proceedings, is being broadcast widely, publicly. There are potential jurors out now uh, listening to this, I'm sure, uh, waiting for an answer from the court as to whether or not they will undergo that further invasion of privacy. Uh, and they are also, I would submit, aware that in this unusual case, the Commonwealth, uh, through their special prosecutor, has sought to charge uh, picketers, protesters, in a very unusual uh, manner, uh, we would claim a, a harassing manner, uh, and our position is that this is just another method of harassment. We believe it's unfair. We ask the court to deny this motion. Do you have any case law to support your argument, Mr. Yanetti? Uh, Your Honor, I, the, 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 the case law is, is simply the constitutional rights to uh, privacy that the jurors have. I mean, uh, yeah. this is, it's an issue of, of uh, fairness, Judge. So that's what we're relying on. All right. So the motion is allowed, Mr. Clerk, number 300. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lally, you're coming into number 12 with me quite skeptical. Number 12 leading questions for 13 and 16 year olds. And again, Your Honor, um, let me just first start by saying I don't think that this is something that's going to be absolutely necessary, um, given what I know of, of the two uh, child witnesses in this case. Um, only filing under abundance of caution, um, more so should um, the need arise based on less so the age of the child, but the age of the child taken in conjunction or in the context of sort of the atmosphere of testifying specifically in this case, in this courtroom, um, with different things uh, going on as far as the amount of people and things of that nature. Um, so I, again, I don't foresee this being an issue, uh, but just an issue that I wanted to flag for the court. Uh, should it become an issue uh, and seek sort of the court's ruling or permission in regard to it uh, prior to any sort of incident arising? Okay, given that caveat, is there any objection? No objection at this point, Your Honor. We can address it as it arises. Okay. Mr. Lally, keep in mind the jurors would much rather hear from the witnesses than from the Commonwealth. Of course. All right. Mr. Clerk, on, on that, we're just going to withhold ruling. Withhold ruling until a later time. Um, Commonwealth, you'll raise this again if need be. Yes, sir. All right. All right, so on your next motion, your number 13, um, <clears throat> huh. I had it, I don't, I don't have it in order, just give me a minute. So th I'm curious, do you happen to have, oh, we don't have the screen up. Do you have it? I'd like to see exactly what it is that you intend to introduce. So this is your motion eliminate to admit evidence that the defendant was in custody for a period of time after her arrest. Jim, is it possible for you to print that for me? Um, 13. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll hear you on this, Mr. Lally, and remind me the date that this body cam footage was taken.
So, Your Honor, this is in reference to uh, the defendant's arrest post-indictment uh, by the grand jury in this case. It was June 9th, 2022. So that's why I have not seen the video itself. Correct. And, and that's certainly something that the Commonwealth uh, can, can provide for the court. But uh, essentially, when she's arrested and uh, during the booking process at the Milton State Police Barracks, um, the troopers who... Uh, conducted that arrest uh, were wearing a uh, body-worn camera um, pursuant to their, their BWC policy uh, with the state police. Um, council has a copy of the policy, council has a copy of the video, and essentially there are a number of different statements which provide sort of um, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, I'm not sure what number we're up to at this point uh, of sort of varying accounts that the defendant has provided to Can numerous Can you give people. me an idea now? Do you, do you know the substance? Do so the substance it? of these particular statements uh, is uh, the defendant, Ms. Reed, uh, continuously uh, is told by Sergeant Buchanan uh, to essentially stop talking. He's advised her over Miranda and advised her to, to stop making statements uh, and repeatedly states that to her during the course of her making statements. Uh, but the sum and substance of it uh, is she says something to the effect of, you know, are you in on the joke? Uh, and that makes some sort of reference uh, to having witnessed Brian Albert and Colin Albert uh, essentially smashed John O'Keefe's head into the taillight, indicating that that's how her taillight was broken. Um, doesn't make any sort of further statements about why she would then leave the scene after that occurred or anything like that. Uh, but these are, again, uh, different accounts uh, that have been made uh, in direct variance to prior statements that she made January 29th uh, to the troopers, to paramedics, to treating medical professionals, to Ms. Roberts, to Ms. McCabe, to uh, the niece of Mr. O'Keefe, to a whole other sort of uh, slew and variety of, of people with a different sort of uh, variation on what transpired uh, each time. Uh, so it's sort of inextricably intertwined uh, with the fact that she's in custody. I, how, I, how so? Is she in handcuffs? Is she in a she's cell? She's seated at the, uh, the booking desk or the booking rail in the state police barracks. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't need to make direct reference to it. I, it's just, again, it's something out of abundance of caution based on sort of where it is and when it is that the statements are made uh, that it may naturally sort of come out as far as it, if the court wishes. I, I think it's something that the court can, can cure uh, by issuing a curative instruction uh, if there's any prejudice to be suffered by the defendant. Uh, but again, um, it is a statement by the defendant, which is admissible as the court is well aware. Uh, and then uh, it is sort of in the confines or in the context of her being in custody when she makes that statement. I certainly wouldn't be trying to elicit testimony that she was in custody, but it, it's, it is kind of apparent that she is. Uh, can you have that here for this afternoon? Uh, yes, I, I can arrange for that. So we can see it? Sure. All right, what's the defendant's position here? We object. Your Honor, uh, we're in a situation now where uh, the Commonwealth arrested Ms. Reed twice when they didn't have to. Uh, I, I made the argument to you at arraignment uh, back in June of 2022 that after John O'Keefe was found dead on the lawn of Brian, Albert, uh, Al Brian Albert's home, um, I immediately got a letter out to the state police saying I represent her. I will surrender her, no need to arrest her, just call me and I'll bring her in. They ignored that and they arrested her uh, to get her into custody, um, I would assert ultimately to make the arguments that Mr. Lally's making today. Uh, then uh, astonishingly to me, uh, after the grand jury issued indictments, based on basically no new evidence, uh, they uh, upcharged her and once again did not contact me despite the fact that she was completely in compliance with the terms of her release and had made every court appearance. They arrested her again. Uh, and so again, I would assert to be in the position that there are, they are in today. Um, with regard to the case that they cited, Your Honor, uh, Hoffer does not stand for the proposition that they claim that it does. Uh, in fact, uh, the issue of uh, that defendant being taken into custody was stricken by the court. Uh, the uh, testimony in that case 
uh, that was allowed uh, or sanctioned by the SJC was uh, evidence that uh, the defendant had been living uh, with his uh, girlfriend but had unexplained absences, he didn't get along with her son, she was afraid of him, and that he associated with uh, a, conduct, a, a convict that made her uh, nervous. There was nothing about him being in custody that was admitted in that case. Um, to the extent that these statements are, or the court deems these statements to be relevant and admissible, um, there are other ways to do it. Uh, I do urge the court to watch the video. Yeah, I, I think we'll put it on the screen because I want to see how the jury would look at it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but I will suggest, Your Honor, that there are other ways to accomplish that, uh, you know, either to uh, have testimony about what it was or, failing that, uh, to have the audio of my client making whatever statements they seek to introduce without the video. Uh, an image of my client uh, you know, in handcuffs at a police station is what this court uh, generally tries to avoid, given the fact that as she sits here and as this trial is ongoing, she's presumed to be innocent. We wouldn't bring her up here in, in an orange jumpsuit and then ask the jury to make decisions about her, nor should we uh, display her uh, you know, after the after a, a perp walk at the police station in handcuffs, uh, making these statements. All right. So I need the Commonwealth to. Do you have um, your media person available, Ms. Gilman or Ms. Crawford or whomever? Yes. All right. We're we'll, seeking we'll, to make arrangements for that. All right. We'll put it on the screen just so I can see how the jury would sure. see it. All right. Thank you. So that's. We'll look at that this afternoon. All right, so I'll hear you on the Celebrate motion, uh, your motion number 16, Ms. Delally. Thank you, Your Honor. So in this motion, what the Commonwealth is requesting uh, is uh, for permission uh, for the uh, Celebrate expert, Mr. Whiffen, uh, to uh, conduct a demonstration in the courtroom during the course of his testimony in regard to uh, the um, examination that he did in regard to Ms. McCabe's extraction report and specifically uh, the uh, alleged search, uh, which the defendant purports uh, occurred at 2.27 in the morning and the Commonwealth maintains occurred at 6.23 and 6.24. I want to stop you because one question is how long will this take if we allow it? How long will the demonstration take? So um, really what I'm seeking to do ideally uh, would be for sort of a live demonstration, uh, which I had uh, Mr. Whiffen do and record and provided a copy of, of that to, uh, to counsel as well. Uh, so that recording that I, that I provided uh, has no audio to it, but there was also a uh, PowerPoint presentation that Mr. Whiffen prepared in relation to uh, the same issue uh, that he uh, produced, and then I provided that to, uh, to counsel as well, which essentially goes through what he did. Um, and it also- You're not looking to do a PowerPoint presentation, are no, you? No, no, no. The PowerPoint presentation would not be something I'd be looking to admit. The reason I did the video is in the event that technology is not our friend on that particular day and, and the live demonstration doesn't work, uh, I would then be seeking to uh, introduce the video and have him talk about it uh, while it's playing. Um, it mirrors uh, essentially or exactly uh, what Mr. Whiffen had uh, included in his report, uh, which was done back in uh, almost a year ago at this point and has been provided to counsel. Uh, and is essentially the same thing uh, as what's contained in his report, but just uh, as far as a, a visual uh, aid and demonstration uh, for the jury. Um, I just think it's a bit with when particularly talking about sort of the technical aspects uh, of his particular analysis, uh, the Commonwealth uh, would submit that it would be uh, helpful and assistive uh, to the jury in order for them to have that sort of visual uh, demonstration to go along with uh, obviously the oral testimony of, of the witness as well. All right. Who's arguing this for the defendant? Thank you, Your Honor. We received from the Commonwealth the video that Mr. Lally just described um, about 48 hours ago. So we have not had an opportunity to confer with our expert about that particular issue. Okay. Um, however, just from sort of a cursory review, it does appear that its admission is improper. 
Um, as the Commonwealth acknowledges in its motion, in order for the court to allow a courtroom experiment or reenactment, there are very strict rules concerning that experiment. It has to replicate with exactitude the actual event so that it is fair and informative for the jury. Otherwise, it's prejudicial and would serve only to confuse the jurors. Here, just based on a cursory review, it does not appear that Mr. Whiffen's in-court experiment replicates all of the factors that we know were in existence at the time in question. Does it, does it replicate the factors that he says he considered? So I'll, I'll need to have a little additional time if the court doesn't mind to yeah, confer so, with so my expert. It, yeah, so I will give you time to confer with your expert and file a written response. But that, that's one of the factors that I'm asking you to look into. Understood. And then just, if the court does intend, after a written briefing, to consider admitting that evidence, we would ask to be able to take their expert on voir dire as to that particular issue. Okay. Thank you. All right. How much time, Ms. Little, do you think you'd need to confer with your expert and put something in writing? Um, I believe a, about a week should be sufficient, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I, I neglected to answer the court's question as far as timing. The video uh, demonstration, which is essentially what I'd be asking him to do, is about 19, 20 minutes. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Clerk, that's under advisement. Wait. So... What remains on Commonwealth's Motion 17? The no, statement, so the, 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 So I know this also went, this went to the, the blood draw, but there were statements. That's what separates this from the defense motion to exclude the testing. So I'll hear you on that. Sure. Is the defense objecting to that portion of the Commonwealth's motion? Thank you for, for uh, that opportunity. Not particularly, no. It's the, it's the blood draw and the extraction. Yeah, so the motion had both. So that's why, all right. So I guess we don't need to hear. So the, the part of your motion that concerns the statements made by the defendant, the defense is not objecting to. No, the, uh, very obviously, they're admissions. I mean, everybody knows what the rules are dealing with admissions. <clears throat> so I'm not concerned about that. Okay. All right, so uh, Jim, on 307, it's a split. Um, the Commonwealth is permitted to introduce statements made for purposes of medical treatment. And the certified medical records. But there's an objection as to what we've heard regarding the alcohol testing, the blood testing for alcohol. Okay. Okay. All right, you're number 20, Mr. Lally. Our number... 20, Your Honor, I believe, uh, refers back to the, the same argument that the Commonwealth had made in opposition to the defendant's motion to exclude anything about the nature of the relationship. Okay. Uh, things of that. That's why I don't have it right here. Okay. 21, the out-of-court statements regarding the victim's state of mind. So 21 uh, sort of pertains to that same issue as 20. Uh, so essentially it's, it's the same argument. You're on the same facts underlying it as far as statements uh, that the uh, victim, Mr. O'Keefe, made but, to... But were you making statements regarding like bins in, in those cases, Commonwealth versus bins, the, the state of mind of the defendant, the defendant... I mean, state of mind of the victim, the defendant knowing it, the defendant being able to act as a result specifically. Okay. So on that sort of specific application of it, and that's, that's why we filed two separate motions right. in relation to it. But as it applies to that, uh, the Commonwealth would submit it as clearly met its burden under the case law as it applies to that because of the nature of some of those communications. Uh, so it's not just communications that are observed uh, by other parties as far as what uh, the victim, Mr. O'Keefe, uh, indicated uh, to Ms. Reed or these 
aren't in situations like in some of the case law where it's an indication to a third party and the defendant wasn't present and then there's sort of an inference that can be made that, well, if they're saying it to this friend of theirs, then they must have communicated that to the person with whom they were in the relationship with. In this instance, Your Honor, we have direct communication between Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed uh, via text communications from each of their phones uh, indicating that that communication about ending the relationship was made just prior to uh, the date of his death in this particular case. Uh, so it not only uh, enhances but what I would submit is corroborates uh, that testimony from, from other sources or from other family members and, and other witnesses. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth that would ask that this motion be allowed. All right. Your Honor, on this motion, our position is that uh, we'd like more specificity about which statements the Commonwealth is indicating they seek to admit. Um, I imagine that's the same thing I said to you, Mr. Lally, and the other one that was right. uh, in connection with this. Right. So the Commonwealth will do that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And, and I think then at that point we can evaluate it, Your Honor. Certainly some of these statements are, are going to come in. Uh, but we'd like the opportunity to be able to object if they uh, are no, not I, I, I agree. So it has to be clear. So, you know, as far as the your notice to the defense, you can even point to grand jury minutes or whatever. But I need to know the, the statements you intend to introduce. Understood, Your Honor. And, and what I can do and what I'm, I aim to do to sort of an um, ancillary thing is um, I'd like to... Uh, if the court is amenable and counsel is amenable to, to pre-mark as many exhibits as possible um, just to make the situation easier for both sides uh, as far as referencing documents, photographs, videos, things of that nature. Um, so when it comes to, uh, I'm not seeking to introduce, uh, when it comes to any sort of the, the cell phone extractions, um, I'm certainly not opposed to uh, admitting the entire extraction a dump essentially from from anybody's individual phone uh, but what I'd like to do uh, as far as exhibits are concerned is to uh, print out or create sort of uh, extraction reports uh, from those cell phones as far as different communications between person A person B just to make it more simple for the jury to to digest it and more simple for I think everyone involved to understand sort of the, the exact communications that we uh, intend to talk about. Uh, so in that vein as well, uh, what I can do is, is provide uh, a supplemental memorandum in regard to 20 and 21, referencing sort of those specific conversations. Okay. That would be great. And it, if you can work together, and this will be part of the housekeeping we talk about this afternoon, um, work together to pre-mark exhibits, that would be great. All right, so 22. So again, with 20, with respect to 22, uh, and I think the same can probably be said uh, for 23 uh, and 24 and 25, uh, is that essentially, uh, as I've stated earlier, the Commonwealth is somewhat operating in the dark and that I don't have any discovery, I don't have a witness list, I don't have any investigator reports or notes or notice of an expert or notice of an, any sort of expert reports, curriculum vitae really anything. Um, so out of an abundance of caution, the Commonwealth filed uh, motion to eliminate number is 22, which is in reference to any alleged bad character or any prior misconduct uh, of the victim or any witness uh, that the defendant alleges uh, to uh, seek to elicit through whatever witnesses uh, they may or may not have. Uh, but essentially what I would state in regard to this specific issue uh, is that as the court is well aware, it has to be uh, something that uh, is first of all relevant uh, to any Thing, and it also has to be relevant uh, to a reputation and not just an anecdotal uh, something that, that's brought up from one witness, again, who I, I don't even know who those witnesses would be at this time. So um, I don't know that the court can rule on it without any sort of notice uh, as to whether or not the defendant intends to seek to introduce such evidence or has any such evidence or who those witnesses would be or what their level of, of knowledge would be, but it's, it's something that I at least wanted to, uh, to flag uh, for the court in regard to um, if it comes up as we go along. Who's responding? That would be me, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, this will be very brief. Um, 
the Commonwealth, in their, at least in their moving papers, uh, Mr. Lally, uh, I, I think, has gently stepped back from the moving papers a little bit. The moving papers suggest that they seek to preclude the defense pre from presenting any evidence to the jury that uh, one or more of their witnesses lied or gave false information in, in this case in any particular. They call this, they, they do this under the rubric of bad character, but that misunderstands or misapprehends what bad or what character evidence actually is. Character evidence or bad character evidence refers to using past behaviors or past traits of a person to prove a, a propensity to act in a certain way in the future. Um, conversely, Proving that someone lied or gave false or misleading information regards to, in, in regards to a, a specific matter that's relevant and material to the case at hand, that's called impeachment. And that's allowed in every single courtroom <clears throat> across so the So impeachment's certainly allowed, but do you intend to put on witnesses regarding challenging character evidence? No, yeah. we're not intending to. That, that's exactly what I was going to summarize by saying the, the bad character focuses on general character traits, uh, whereas impeachment deals with people who right. lied or were untruthful. We Mr. intend Lally, to do the latter. Hold on. Mr. Lally, you're not objecting to impeachment, prior inconsistent statements, things like that? No, of course so not. So you... you um, Counsel, you mentioned that there is a distinction between character evidence right. and straight impeachment. Character evidence is not permissible because you're not going to introduce it, you said, right? We're not seeking to introduce it at this point, and we wouldn't. I mean, obviously, the trial has to play out, and it's going to be several weeks. And by the way, Mr. Lally has mentioned over and over and over about how he has no reports and no statements, et cetera. He's got more than 7,000 reports and statements, both from his own investigation and from the federal investigation, that in, in no small part encapsulates a lot of what we intend to impeach with. However, as I stand here today, I can report to the court that we don't intend at this juncture to put on bad character evidence. We, we don't know what that might look like. Oh. But if we did, obviously I know the rules. I would give the Commonwealth due notice and, and the court notice before right. we went that direction. All right. So 312, Mr. Clerk, is allowed. If you need to readdress that, uh, defense counsel, um, you need to file a motion. Okay. So 30, 312, Jim, is allowed. Uh, same thing, do you intend to put on character evidence? Uh, it's a difficult standard or potentially problematic, but uh, do you intend to do it? Your Honor, we at this juncture do not have intend to put on character evidence, but we will give the court notice as well as Mr. Lally notice if we do change our mind. All right, so 313, Jim, is allowed and defendants can renew it. I'm sorry, what's the second part? Allowed? Defendants can renew it yeah. by written motion. How about 24? Is there an objection to that? I believe that was 24, yeah. No, that was no, 23. Oh, 20, did I apologize. 23, we had said we had no objection. Okay, I didn't And have 24 that. is the opinion or character. Okay, so 24 is, all right. I'm sorry. 20, 24 is allowed, Jim. 23 and 24 are allowed. All right, there's an objection to 25, Ms. Little. Just yes, yes or no. Mr. All right, so, so I'm going to hear from Mr. Lally on the motion. I just wanted to know if there was an objection. Your Honor, I could probably, if I don't, I don't mean to step on Mr. Lally's toes, if he wants to talk, he can talk. Uh, we don't anticipate asking any of our experts to read from a treatise. If that's what his concern is, and that's how I read the motion, we don't anticipate going there. That might short circuit this. So no treatise, no studies? They will refer to studies and not to read from studies on the witness stand at this point, at this juncture. Certainly, their, their studies are the foundation of every expert's um, testimony. Okay, okay but, but what he's saying is he, he has no discovery of even who your experts are, so how's he going to read all these articles? I understand, so. I understand that. As the court knows, and, and we anticipate, and I think Mr. Unetti is going to address this with the court soon enough, he will be getting our expert reports. We now have, finally, uh, their, uh, their final notice of what their discovery is. Certificate uh, of compliance. And we are anticipating by the, the beginning of trial, by Tuesday, to have something in response to that. But no, we're not going to elicit uh, an expert to sit there and read from a study or read from a treatise, if that's what their concern is. 
Anything you wanted to add to this? It looks a little broader than that to me. It, it is a little bit broader than that um, as far as it also refers to anecdotal experiences or, or things of that nature, which obviously wouldn't be contained within a study or wouldn't be contained within certain materials. Uh, so I, I'm sure counsel is well aware, and I'm, I'm not certainly saying that they're not as, as far as what an expert can testify to and what an expert cannot testify to. Um, but essentially what an expert can testify to is, is facts that they personally observe based on testing or things that they do uh, themselves. Um, facts uh, in regard to uh, things that are in evidence or things that the council reasonably expects will be put into evidence. But the studies themselves, any sort of anecdotal uh, experiences that they may have had uh, or any sort of um, scientific literature uh, is not something that is permissible to be admitted as, as an exhibit. So if that is something that they seek to, uh, to talk about, uh, the Commonwealth would submit that that's improper. You know, what they did in this particular case, sort of what their baseline of experience is, what their baseline as far as their educational background in order to form some sort of opinion based on, on the facts as the, as the jury finds them uh, is certainly fine. But making any reference uh, to because it happened in this study, it must be true in this case is, is something that's simply not permitted. Okay. If I may, just briefly. Sure. Mr. Lally uses the phrase anecdotal experience. That's the first time I've ever heard that in, in this context. I don't know what he means by that. But if what he means by that is bringing into court something that the expert has done or experienced or has experience with and then relating that back to his opinion or his, her, her conclusion, isn't that what he's suggesting Mr. Whiffen do with his in-court experiment? That sounds like an anecdotal experience. But that, that's just me. I think we have to take this on a case-by-case -case basis um, and, and, and figure out what the experts are going to say. I, I don't know what anecdotal experience means. So I can't really defend against that because I've put hundreds, if not thousands, of experts on the stand. I don't know that I've ever asked, can you tell the jury what your anecdotal experience is with fill in the blank? So I'm not sure what he, and I'm not being glib, I just don't know what that means. So. I don't know that the court can adequately rule on it. I think this may be something that we wait until... The so let's get the list of the experts. Take a look at the Commonwealth's discovery, I mean the uh, defendant's expert discovery to you, and you can raise it again. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. So, um, Jim, let's say no action taken. <laughs> All right, 27. I'll hear you, Mr. Lally. Yes, so, Your Honor, this motion eliminates in reference to uh, prohibiting uh, reference to any federal investigations conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office or, and or the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Uh, so to this point, um, the U.S. Attorney's, Attorney's Office has uh, publicly confirmed that at no time uh, has the U.S. Attorney's Office named any person or entity uh, as a target. Uh, so any sort of reference uh, to, uh, in, and essentially what they've uh, stated uh, throughout the course of, and I know the court has had a chance to review those materials, but what they state uh, is essentially their investigation into some unnamed uh, uh, criminal activity or some unnamed crime or some, there, there's nothing specific uh, to any specific person or entity uh, that is contained within those materials. So what the Commonwealth is submitting is that any reference to the fact that those things occurred uh, is therefore uh, unfair, you know, essentially biases uh, against uh, one side or the other based on, uh, based on that. And it really has no relevancy. As far as making reference to, uh, you know, if, if counsel at some point either side wants to make reference to uh, testimony or uh, statements, reports, things of that nature that were provided uh, in the course of, of that discovery uh, pursuant to the TUI, uh, obviously that's 
perfectly permissible, but it also can be done without making reference to where that item came from as far as you, you know, testify previously in relation to some investigation on such and such a date. Uh, you know, uh, you spoke to uh, a law enforcement agent on such and such a date and you said this. Um, so it, if it's needed for those kinds of reasons as far as impeachment and whatever, that's obviously perfectly permissible, but any reference uh, to that in front of the jury, uh, Your Honor, uh, is something that the Commonwealth would submit uh, is simply impermissible and irrelevant uh, to the facts uh, as they pertain to this case. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth would ask that this motion be allowed. Is there an objection to this? There is. <laughs> Your Honor, the Commonwealth's position can be basically summed up in their moving papers with the following sentence that they drafted. The proceeding would be unfairly prejudiced if the, if the defendant is permitted to rely on the mere appearance or existence of a federal investigation, especially where the investigation was shaped and influenced by the defense. First of all, the defense does not and did not shape or influence any federal investigation. The federal government is more than capable, Your Honor, and I think the Commonwealth knows this, of making its own decisions and, about its own investigations. Second. And just as importantly, the Commonwealth cites no authority whatsoever that stands for the proposition that the mere mention of a federal investigation prejudices state court proceedings in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And that's because there is no authority. That authority does not exist. But most importantly, and this is critical, it is going to be critical to give the trier of fact, this jury, the proper context in which every one of the statements or every bit of the evidence is presented and how it came to light. It's essential for how, the jury. How are you going to do that? How do you propose? You, is somebody from the U.S. Attorney's Office on your witness list to come in and talk about it? There are federal agents. No, 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 no. We, we don't anticipate presenting the fact that there's a federal investigation. That's isn't not, isn't that what this does? If no, you mention it, no. what, explain, what this does, explain to me why that's not so. The, that's what I'm doing. As the, as not, the court, not yet, you haven't. So please explain that. As the court knows, it's essential that the jury is given the context in which every single statement, whatever the statement might be, is brought to light. Does that mean, do we say in the prior trial that resulted in a mistrial, you said this? N no, but you would say when you were speaking with Officer Smith or Officer right. Jones from the Canton Police Department at the Canton Police Station in this particular context, did you say this? When you, were, uh, when you were questioned by the Commonwealth's attorney in this proceeding, did you say this? When you were questioned by the United States attorney in this hearing, did you say that? That's what we do. Otherwise, it's perpetrating a fraud on the jury. The information that's gleaned during the federal investigation was revealed, Your Honor, importantly, by a neutral third party a neutral body that's not connected in any way to this case. The Commonwealth has a stake in this case, very obviously. The defense certainly has a stake in this case, but the federal authorities have no stake in the case of the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Thus, the evidence procured by that neutral agency, which is independent of the case, is subject to a different and completely, a completely different level of scrutiny, a completely different level of assessment by the jurors. That is an important fact. There is no other way to truthfully and honestly present this evidence to the jury. Think, think about some of the questions that the court just posed. What were the circumstances in which you changed your testimony, sir? He's going to say, well, I changed my testimony, potentially, when I was called before a federal grand jury and I was asked questions under penalty of perjury. Why did you finally admit certain things when you were confronted with additional evidence, ma'am? And where did that evidence come from? Well, I was called before a grand jury and I was asked, or I was investig uh, I'm sorry, I was interviewed by a federal agent and I was asked or confronted with additional information, text messages, phone calls, etc. Or the third example, where did that additional evidence come from, officer? Text messages. Uh, phone calls, private communications. Oh, it came from uh, a hearing in which I was questioned by a United States attorney under penalty of perjury in front of a grand jury. The jury's entitled to those answers in that context. If we were to do what Mr. Lally suggests, if we were to take that invitation, oh, well, you were asked by a prosecutor at a former hearing uh, X, Y, Z. That would leave the jurors with the imprimatur of the idea that the Commonwealth elicited those questions. 
that the Commonwealth did their job when we know, in fact, it didn't. The answers to those questions directly go to Ms. Reed's Bowdoin defense. Bowdoin talks about the inadequacy of an investigation. Obviously, Mr. Lally, I'm sorry, Mr. Yannetti can talk more about that in just a second. We have information that a different agency was able to uncover information that the state investigation ignored. That's important. And it's important for the jurors to be able to weigh and balance that information and how the information came to light. If the truth is actually hidden from the jury, which is what the Commonwealth is asking the court to do, that the evidence was produced by a, was the product of a third party, the truth being that the evidence was the product of a third party inquiry, unconnected to the state court case, then that jury is left with a false impression, false information, and it'll be unable to, unable to properly assess the true facts, which is what we're trying to get to, the true facts. Why is the Commonwealth so intent on hiding the truth from this jury. I'll submit. Okay. I'll likely rule on that today. So, number 28, Mr. Lally. So, again, similar to the, the motion previous to it, um, the Commonwealth is not seeking to hide anything from uh, the jury. Uh, what the Commonwealth is simply seeking to do is ensure that whatever information that's provided to the jury is actual admissible and relevant information and not uh, the, the product of uh, rank speculation. So this motion uh, is seeking to prohibit reference to any pending internal affairs investigation or uh, unfounded allegations of misconduct. And really, primarily what we're talking about here uh, is any sort of uh, internal affairs investigation related to uh, Trooper Proctor and uh, the 20 something year old uh, uh, civil case uh, which resulted in no findings of liability uh, that was referenced uh, by counsel in their motion to dismiss with reference to Sergeant Lank of the Canton Police Department. Uh, under the case law, uh, including McFarland uh, and uh, Graham, the most recent case law, uh, what they essentially uh, attribute is that those uh, types of information, when there is no uh, finding of liability, there is no sustained finding of misconduct, there is no finding uh, uh, findings of liability uh, by uh, the party at question, uh, that that is simply not admissible. Uh, and so for those reasons, uh, the Commonwealth submits that this motion should also be allowed. All right. Who's arguing this for the defense? And Ms. Little, what I, I need to know is what exactly you intend to introduce and how you intend to introduce it. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think it's it's somewhat premature for the court to, to rule on this issue. Obviously, the testimony of both of these witnesses is going to be highly relevant as to whether this particular information is relevant. Um, we are still actually receiving information with regards to the internal affairs investigation as recently as yesterday. Um, so I'm happy to like kind of defer ruling to the court and then address this as it comes up. I think the court will be in a much better position to rule on this issue once the witness testifies. All right. So it would be helpful to me once you know what it is you think you're going to try and introduce um, to tell me how that complies with the holdings in both McFarland and Graham. There are independent reasons why that is admissible outside of McFarland and Graham. Okay. So I need to know all of that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'll take this under advisement. And how much time do you need to give me at least a general response now? Can you have it by Tuesday? We can do that, Your Honor. OK. All right, so I'll hold off on that, Mr. Clerk. Yes, Your Honor. All right. So number 29, Mr. Lally. Thank <laughs> you. 
So this motion, Your Honor, uh, is essentially entitled uh, motion to eliminate for advance notice if defendant intends to cross-examine any witness about alleged bias uh, and request for a pretrial ruling on whether proposed evidence demonstrates a plausible showing uh, of alleged bias. Uh, so the Commonwealth is not uh, stating that there are uh, no statements, uh, as the court is well aware, uh, that could uh, be interpreted to reflect uh, bias and could be used uh, by counsel in cross-examination. Uh, so. Uh, what the Commonwealth is not suggesting, uh, and bless you, is uh, for any prohibition on any statements whatsoever. What the Commonwealth is seeking here is uh, a ruling as to what precise uh, statements the defendant seeks to introduce uh, in regard to that uh, so that the court can make a ruling prior uh, to uh, the witness testifying before the jury as to exactly what's in play and what is going to be admissible and what's going to be allowed uh, as far as, um, obviously it's not a perfect world. and. And if uh, a witness were to answer something in a way uh, that uh, would then um, open the door for, for further material to come in, that's understandable. But at least a preliminary showing as to exactly what uh, the defendant submits are the statements they wish to introduce in relation to this issue. Isn't the defendant given broad range and cross-examination as to bias? Yes, uh, and, and that's why I... I indicated early on uh, that I understand that there is a uh, some um that there certainly is uh, some areas uh that under the law whether or not they're true or not are are able to be explored as far as cross examination is concerned uh but what this motion simply seeks to address uh is there are restrictions to that it's it's not unfettered it's not you know just anything and everything that they could possibly think of as say as far as accusations go. Is there um, any particular type of testimony you're concerned about? I mean, is, is there anything in particular that you say they should not pr be permitted to go into? Based on what we've heard throughout the pendency of this case, is there anything? I mean, I'm reluctant to tie the defendant's hands in any way on cross-examination without knowing exactly what it is you think is improper. Okay. And what I would do, Your Honor, what I would uh, suggest is uh, similar to the other motions that we spoke of before. I can provide I can provide a supplemental with more specifics as to what the Commonwealth's concerns are, okay. uh, if the court would find that helpful. Yes, I, I can't rule on this as is. So, is there any objection to that, Mr. Yannetti? You're nodding. Well, no, I, I think that makes sense. Okay. I, it was Ms. Little's uh, motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw you nodding. I don't want to step on her toes. Uh, no objection to that, Your Honor. Okay. All right, so why don't you do that? So, sure. Mr. Clerk, we'll hold off on ruling on this until we get something from the Commonwealth. Okay. So, so Commonwealth will clarify. Right, and then no action taken. All right, so as you know, third party culprit and Bowden are often argued together, often presented together. Why don't we just deal with the two motions together? So, Commonwealth's file, you're, you're number 30 and 31, um, Mr. Lally. Um, Mr. Yannetti, are you arguing both? Does it make sense to sort of keep them together? I agree that they should be kept together. Yeah. All right, so why don't I hear you as to your concerns on both? and. And as you know, sometimes third-party culprit, as it goes to Bowdoin, is different than just straight third-party culprit. And actually, it might save us a lot of time. Is that what you intend to do, Ms. Tionetti? Third-party culprit as it well, goes to Bowdoin or straight third-party culprit as well? Definitely third-party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin. That's for sure. Um, and then depending on how the evidence develops at trial, um, there may be, uh, you know, an, uh, an offer to offer third-party culprit evidence with regard to third-party culprits. But I think I can speak further to that in response. Mr. Lally, go ahead. You can argue these however you want to argue them. No, it, and, and I, I would argue them sort of in that vein, Your Honor. So understanding that um, based on the state of the evidence, uh, as I anticipate it to be, uh, and in any case, regardless, uh, I think a defendant in any criminal case has a much better um, 
um, shot, essentially, at getting evidence in regarding to Bowdoin as sort of a backdoor through, uh, excuse me, as a third-party culprit, as sort of a backdoor through uh, a Bowdoin defense. Uh, so what I'm primarily concerned with, Your Honor, is, is uh, motion eliminate number 30, uh, because as the court is well aware, uh, there have been a number of, of theories of uh, sort of uh, speculation, rank speculation, uh, opinions uh, without any evidentiary support, uh, names of certain people that have been dropped at this microphone by counsel at different uh, pretrial hearings uh, who are not witnesses, who have nothing to do with this case, who don't know anything about this case, uh, who counsel when they said those names and sort of dropped those whatever they supported to be facts, uh, knew that they had nothing to say and nothing to do with this case. Um, what I'm uh, concerned about is whatever is acceptable as far as uh, uh, believability when it comes to arguing things in pretrial motions, shouting things from courthouse steps, or you know, bandying about on Twitter is, is not what we do here. Um, and so now it is a time where uh, counsel is going to be relegated to what is actual, admissible, relevant evidence. Uh, and what I'm uh, asking uh, for in this motion is for the de defendant, through her counsel, to actually provide any admissible or relevant evidence that pertains to third-party culprit, which to this point they have not done. Uh, so if this is something that's going to be raised as an issue on its own, uh, as the court is well aware, what the uh, case law indicates is that the acts uh, of the other person are so closely connected in point of time and method of operation as to cast doubt upon the identification of the defendant as a person who committed the crime. It has to be specific. Um, it has to be uh, to at least a specific realm of person. Uh, or a specifically identified person uh, who would have motive, opportunity uh, to commit uh, the act with which the defendant is charged. And up until this point, I have not seen anything uh, specific as to that. As it pertains uh, to uh, the Bowdoin uh, motion the Commonwealth filed, what the Commonwealth is asking for there is, is notice and, and voir dire in relation uh, to a Bowdoin defense. So if there is, uh, again, going to be some, you know, it, it's, I don't think the evidence comes anywhere we're close uh, to a Bowdoin instruction, uh, but certainly uh, what the courts have said uh, over time uh, is that uh, a Bowdoin defense is something that uh, if the evidence warrants it, uh, counsel can uh, elicit testimony in regard to it uh, or attempt to uh, and uh, make arguments in reference to it. So I'm not seeking to preclude uh, counsel from, from making arguments or from counsel asking questions. What I'm uh, seeking clarification on is, is what uh, exactly, uh, and again, this is from a position of, of operating without any information whatsoever as, as to what uh, a defense may be. And understanding uh, that uh, counsel was not required uh, to provide any information until the Commonwealth filed its certificate of compliance, uh, but there's been, regardless of whether they were required to or not, I, I'm, I'm going into trial on Tuesday without any information whatsoever as to, as to who they've spoken to, what, they're into, uh, what statements they might be, who their witnesses are, or anything of that nature. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth uh, feels it appropriate to at least file a motion to be given notice as to exactly uh, what the defendant intends to do. Um, this, the trial by ambush is simply not something that's permitted uh, uh, by the case law, uh, and that's what the Commonwealth is seeking to, uh, to prohibit in that second motion. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. Nettie, I'll hear you. Thank you. And though they're argued together, I do want you to also start with the third-party culprit alone, not third-party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin, but third-party culprit alone because of all those factors that I told you, as you well know, the case law is clear, that I have to consider. And if I had to do it now, and you know I can do it pretrial, Right? You know that I can, today I can just exclude it. I'm not inclined to do that, but I need to be able to make those decisions, to, in, to weigh those factors, because right now I have zero information on Right, this. I understand that, Your Honor, and uh, that was my plan going into today anyway. Uh, so the, the initial question is, um, why is there a third-party culprit defense? Why is it relevant? Um, and we start, Your Honor, with the fact that our forensic medical examiner, Frank Sheridan, um, you know, a pathologist, forensic pathologist who has uh, performed himself thousands and thousands of autopsies, has already submitted a sworn affidavit to this court 
that John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with having been in a fight and are not consistent with having been hit by a car. Uh, since he submitted that affidavit, the federal authorities have provided us with their reports whereby FBI experts also corroborate that John O'Keefe's injuries are not consistent with having been hit by a car. They employed experts in biomechanics and kinematics who have reviewed the evidence in this case and they've confirmed that the physical evidence uh, conf uh, essentially shows and doesn't show what Dr. Sheridan has opined. So therefore, <clears throat> if John O'Keefe was not hit by a car, that means that Cameron Reed did not kill him. And we know that John O'Keefe did not die of natural causes. This was not a heart attack or a stroke. John O'Keefe was injured. He was mortally injured. If he was not hit by a car, as both our expert and FBI confirmed, then he was attacked. And if, if he was not hit by a car, then there is a third party culprit or culprits. So by asking this court to prohibit the defense from introducing evidence that others had the motive, opportunity, and the means to attack John O'Keefe. The Commonwealth is essentially asking this court to prohibit Karen Reed from being able to defend herself. So I, I don't think they're asking that you be prohibited from doing that. They're asking first to have you tell them what that is. Right. Well, this is, you know, Your Honor, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that in terms of the, right, so go, the, go ahead. You, the have, you have your remarks. That, that we're either required to give them or not. Um, you know, it is not our job to solve this case for the prosecution. It's our contention. They had the opportunity to do that, but they failed. It is not our job to name a specific third-party culprit. We do not have to prove that Brian Albert or Colin Albert or Brian Higgins or some combination of them intended to kill John O'Keefe. We don't have to prove that any of them attacked John O'Keefe such that he eventually died. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they didn't. But the fact of the matter is there is evidence that all three of them had a motive, had they, the opportunity and the means to attack John O'Keefe. Now, the, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Conkey in their motion, and as this court started the discussion on this issue when you first <laughs> took the bench, Conkey makes clear that a defendant has a constitutional right to argue that somebody else may have committed the crime. And certainly, no, the acts of that person can't be too attenuated in time or method of operation, as Mr. Lally uh, mentions. But in terms of being the right time period, Your Honor, you can't get any closer than their presence at the scene at the very time that John O'Keefe was killed. And in terms of the method of operation, given that we have evidence that he was not hit by a car and that he was attacked, all three of these men, either alone or in combination, possessed the ability to attack him with or without a weapon. I mean, it's a very low standard here. The Commonwealth acknowledges that. It's a low standard of simple relevance. And the evidence here establishes relevance. Now, I would note, Your Honor, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Finney. I don't know if they realize this, but that was my case. I represented Roland Douglas Finney before the Supreme <clears throat> Judicial Court, and I represented him at his motion for new trial and at his retrial. And that case, the Finney case, provides strong support for the introduction of third-party culprit evidence here, um, irrespective of a Bowdoin defense. Um, in fact, the reason that Mr. Finney's conviction was overturned was that his trial counsel failed to pursue, pursue a third-party culprit defense. And, Your Honor, the third-party culprit defense in Finney was weaker, far weaker, than the third-party culprit defense we have here. The evidence of motive in that case was that the third-party culprit made derogatory statements about the victim after she was murdered. No witness in that case put the two of them together. No witness in that case put the third-party culprit at the scene of the murder where the victim was murdered. There was some consciousness of guilt evidence similar to what we have in this case. But in Finney, the SJC ruled that not only was that enough for a defense attorney to present uh, a third-party culprit defense, but he was ineffective for not doing so. And as the, the court uh, has also uh, <coughs> touched upon, 
Uh, the, the SJC found that on the basis of that third party culprit evidence, which is weaker than what we have here, there were substantial connecting links between that third party culprit that justified the admission of hearsay in that case. And I want to make it clear, we're, we're not looking to introduce any hearsay statements, so we're, we don't need substantial connecting links here. Now, Your Honor, I could go through with the court the specific evidence we have with regard to motive, opportunity, and means with regard to the three Commonwealth witnesses that I've named. So uh, go ahead. Happy to do it. Uh, starting with Brian Higgins. He was present at 34 Fairview Road on January 28th to 29th. He was close friends with the homeowner, Brian Albert. He had a prior romantic interest in Karen Reed. He did not expect Karen and John O'Keefe to be at the waterfall that bar on January 28th. Karen Reed did not greet Higgins, despite the fact that they had previously exchanged flirtatious texts and that she had uh, been at his apartment one evening, although there was nothing that took place between them any more than a peck of a kiss. At the waterfall, Higgins does not engage with John O'Keefe. He does not say goodbye to John O'Keefe and Karen when he leaves, but before he leaves, he texts Karen, and that text was something to the effect of, um, well, with a lot of M's. Uh, we know that there was a preservation order from this court, your predecessor, Judge Krupp, to preserve his cell phone, and that Trooper Proctor gave an, uh, him an edict um, to, to uh, you know, an order to serve uh, on Brian Higgins, and he left it at the front desk of the Canton Police Station for him, and that Higgins, we learned through the federal investigation, Higgins became angry, demanded that Proctor uh, come back, and he essentially upbraided him and read him the Riot Act, which shows a little bit about Higgins' personality. Um, at the end of the night, everyone discussed going back to 34 Fairview, and when he gets back to 34 Fairview, he texts not Karen, he texts John O'Keefe at 12.20 a.m. He testified before the federal grand jury that he had no knowledge that they had been invited to 34 Fairview, but that is contradicted by this text message and the inference is that he was coaxing John to come to that house. And, you know, we're not saying this gives him a motive to kill John, but we don't have to show that. Uh, any motive to feel hostility or animosity towards John O'Keefe um, goes to his motive. And, Your Honor, when Brian Higgins and Brian Albert are in that house, they're the only two people who are unaccounted for when the rest of the group was in the kitchen. And they claimed that they were looking at photographs together. And we have evidence that they were in the basement. We believe that Brian Albert made a mistake before the state grand jury by testifying they went upstairs to look at photos. Brian Higgins says unequivocally that the only place the two went was into the living room to look at photos, the military ribbons, whatever they were looking at. Brian Higgins did not know that Brian Albert had said they went upstairs. And he also testified he had never been upstairs at Brian Albert's house in his life. That means that if Brian Albert said they went upstairs, they're coming up from the basement. And before leaving 34 Fairview, Brian Higgins testified he was parked right in front of the mailbox. He would have had to have walked by where John O'Keefe's body was. His headlights when he got in his vehicle would have been illuminating where John O'Keefe's body would have been in the yard if it were actually there. So how does he not see it? He then goes back to the Canton Police Station at 1.30 in the morning after leaving 34 Fairview. He claimed to do some administrative work, but then he admitted to the federal grand jury that he was there to move his car because of the upcoming snowstorm. <clears throat> this suggests that he was fabricating a reason for going back to Canton Police to establish an alibi for himself. Um, he was asked several times at the federal grand jury if he had any conversations with anyone before he went to bed. Uh, and when was he notified that John O'Keefe was dead? In the morning, he said. 
He testified under the pains and penalties of perjury that he had absolutely no contact with any person that night for any reason whatsoever. But he apparently was surprised that the federal authorities had subpoenaed his phone records and he had to admit, and he did admit under oath, he made that 2.22 a.m. phone call around the same, about uh, you know, five minutes before Jennifer McCabe is Googling how long to die in the cold, about eight minutes before Brian Laughlin, the plow driver, first drives by the house and sees nobody at all. And the next morning, Brian Higgins, the first thing, first person he spoke to was Brian Albert. After right, did, I'm, I'm gonna stop you for a minute. I think we need a break, Madam Court Reporter. Do you need a break? Can you go, how much longer do you think you have with this, Mr. Yannetti? How many more pages or how long you think? Yeah, I've got about, uh, in terms of my recitation of the facts, uh, I've done about a page and a half and I've got three left. Madam Court Reporter, would you like to take a little break? It's hot in here and you've been going nonstop. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break.
Welcome back, everyone. As we take a live look out at the Mass Pike, you can see raindrops covering our camera. That's what we're dealing with as you head out the door on this Friday morning. <laughs> we're used to it, though, at this point, Jason. What do they say? April showers bring May flowers. We're getting there. We're getting it, it there. It better bring some May flowers. Yeah. The next year is going to have to answer to all of us here in New England. So as far as our morning rush hour commute, and certainly as the kids are going to be heading off to school here before the break next week, it is a rainy mess out there. I don't think I've seen our live cam. They are looking at the mass bike like that in quite some time. We're going to still be dealing with some pop ups later on this afternoon along with windy conditions, but eviction that is my weather word for today as we're hoisting a lot of that warm and very sort of unstable air mass right into our area, allowing for these showers to kind of be prevalent throughout the rest of the morning into the early afternoon. What we do know, though, in our next weather forecast is that this potent front is going to cause another round of some moderate to heavy showers along with some stronger winds at least over the next several hours before we start to clear things out by the evening commute there. But we're still going to be dealing with the backside of this low as conditions improve this afternoon. So we'll throw some more clouds back into the mix for us tomorrow, along with cooler conditions for us on Saturday. And then we start to eye a little bit of a warming trend for early next week. Rain chances again, wave goodbye to them, at least for the most part, once we get into, let's say about 2, 3 p.m. this afternoon. By 7, though, we start to kind of pick ourselves up by the bootstraps and clear our skies out just a wee bit. But look at this mess. We have plenty of colors in terms of our weather palette this morning, the darker colors and also the brighter colors. The darker greens and the brighter oranges and reds and yellows are all indicating uh, some pretty significant rain that is now moving through the area. Let's talk about what we can also expect as we are eyeing for the rest of the afternoon, some of these showers moving on out and others just moving on in behind it. So back towards the south and also west right now, we had some earlier lightning strikes, so I think we're going to likely see some rumbles coming out of this thing, certainly as it moves closer to the Mass Pike and also south of Worcester. So within the next half hour or so, shout us out Worcester, uh, Worcester and let us know if you hear some rumbles there. Along uh, the Mass Pike over to 495, this is very heavy, friends, and also with the fog, this is going to be a very, very treacherous uh, roadway between Worcester and 495 this morning. Over to Newton, Austin, Brighton, a little bit of a light to moderate shower for you. Lynn Revere over to Beverly, getting up to the Cape Ann region, Gloucester, Manchester by the sea. Just some pockets of moderate uh, to heavy showers. Salem over to Lawrence, still expecting a little bit of activity as well. But notice, once we get back over towards Western Mass, the Berkshires and certainly going to be down south towards the Connecticut region, it is mainly dry, and that's that drier punch we're going to work on in here. But look at the Midwest, look at the Northeast. We are the only ones in the lower 48 that still have our heads in the buckets, okay? All other areas from the South to the West to the Central, the High Plains are enjoying a nice, and I do mean a nice, bit of sunshine. Over the past 24 hours, we've certainly had a little bit more than a drop in the bucket, only about a quarter of an inch here in Boston, but we'll add maybe about three tenths of an inch once we get into the afternoon hours. Begin outside right now, roughly around 60 degrees here in the city, with pockets of moderate to dense fog, certainly along and also stretching south of the city there. As temperatures climb out of the upper 50s, we'll likely land amid the lower 60s later on this afternoon before the 50s move back in, but still expect some of those gusty winds along the north and south shore for the rest of the afternoon. Saturday and Sunday, 50s give way to 60s and 60s give way to almost 70, Jordan, for the first couple days of next week. We'll be a little bit cooler by Wednesday and Thursday with another lobe of some showers threatening the area. Karen Reed's final pre-trial hearing getting underway just after 9 this morning. We've continued to follow this breaking news. Several motions have been discussed so far. This is the final pre-trial hearing before it is set to begin the trial next week. The first issue and major motion really here in this case is Reed's right to a third party culprit defense. The judge noted this morning that this is well within Reed's constitutional right. The prosecution argues that theories and names have been dropped by the defense at other pretrial hearings, but the defense presented evidence just moments ago that they have for three potential other suspects in the case. The defense says it's not their job to solve the case for the prosecution and that it is Reed's right to argue that someone else did did it. The judge then had a quick break, so we will revisit this, of course, after this break ends. Other relevant motions that were talked about this morning, excluding DNA. This is in regards to a hair that was actually found on Reed's bumper. The defense noted that the hair had been in the Commonwealth's custody. They're set now to just receive it. They say that it's not enough time to prepare for trial next week. The Commonwealth disagreed, saying that they do have enough enough time. The judge will revisit this later on this afternoon. Motions regarding character evidence 
just talked about. There's a motion to exclude evidence by the defense in regards to an incident between Reed and the victim during a vacation in Aruba a month prior. The defense says this has nothing to do with the case, but the prosecution says arguments during that vacation are relevant and show the nature of the relationship. The judge said she will make her decision on that. There was also a similar motion raised by the prosecution filed in regards to character evidence of witnesses. This motion was allowed this morning. Another motion in regards to Turtle Boy. That motion is to exclude irrelevant harassment, which both parties agree on, but the judge isn't sure that she does. The motion, she says, will be denied. Again, that's not official at this time, but it is where she's leaning. The thought here being that if a witness does open that door and the discussion comes in, they have to follow it. The defense has filed a motion to exclude Reed's blood alcohol content reading that night. They say the range is too wide with evidence coming in there between 0.13 and 0.29. They say that that's not reliable, that range. The prosecution, though, wants that blood alcohol content included. The judge is going to wait on a memo there from the Commonwealth. Another motion by the prosecution talked about regards to the manner of death. They don't want that to be testified on. They want the jury to determine it, but the defense says that the manner of death was under Determined. That's what's on John O'Keefe's birth certificate, and they say that is relevant. This is being taken under advisement by the judge. There was also a motion by the prosecution regarding questioning young witnesses that was unopposed. We also had a motion allowed for the criminal records of jurors to be obtained. There's also body camera footage that was talked about this morning. The prosecution wants to admit that into evidence. The judge plans to look at that video this afternoon. The defense argues, though, that displaying that is pre prejudicial. Several other motions by the prosecution were not objected to by the defense, so those moved along pretty quickly this morning. Again, this is ongoing. If these decisions are made in a timely manner, the trial will start on Tuesday. Be sure to stay with WBZ and CBS News Boston for any other updates on the Karen Reed case. We'll be right back.
Marathon Monday is right around the corner. Get ready to cheer on the runners with a poster making party happening in Natick. Join Spark Kindness at Paper Fiesta on Saturday to help spread positivity from Natick all the way to downtown Boston for the marathon. Starting at 9 a.m., bring your inspirational and supportive messages for runners. Poster making materials and popcorn is included. Kick off spring at the Shrewsbury Country Shop on Saturday for their Cheers to Spring Sip and Shop event. Enjoy Cousins Maine Lobster, Fresh Flowers, and shop local vendors all while sipping local wine from Broken Creek Vineyard. There will be giveaways and some surprises too. Don't miss it from 11 to 6. Celebrate Slow Art Day Saturday at the New Bedford Whaling Museum with a special exhibition and free admission. Visitors will use a looking guide to slow down while exploring the details of incredible images by a main artist. Be sure to check out events at the museum all week long for April school vacation. For more on all those events and other news, head to our website, WBZ.com. Thanks so much for streaming here on CBS News Boston on this Friday. I'm Jordan Jagelinzer. Have a great weekend, everyone. The first person that Brian Higgins spoke to was Brian Albert. Um, he had missed a call from Chief Kenneth Berkowitz earlier. Um, immediately after getting off the phone with Brian Albert, Brian Higgins drives back to 34 Fairview, where he has a meeting with uh, just about all the witnesses in this case, Brian Albert, Julie Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe. And immediately after that friends and family meeting, on his day off, which is a Saturday, he returns to the Canton Police Department, where he speaks with all of the first responding officers who had anything to do with this case. So this is a quote-unquote witness accessing and communicating with all the first responding officers, we would argue monitoring what they're doing in regard to the investigation. According to Brian Higgins, he admitted that Chief Berkowitz is one of his best friends, and that's why he had access to all these people. We have a law enforcement witness who will testify to seeing Chief Kenneth Berkowitz and Brian Higgins alone with Karen Reed's vehicle on the afternoon of January 29th of 20, 
22 for, quote, a wildly long time. So is this a name that's been in the materials? Is this, is this a name known to the Commonwealth? Or yes. Is this somebody new? Okay. We, and we've now received video surveillance from the Canton Police Department that shows that there is an interior camera in the Sallyport garage where the car was housed. But in, during the exact time that that third party officer indicates that Berkowitz and Higgins were in the Sallyport together, the video mysteriously cuts out for 42 minutes. Between 508, between 508 and 550 p.m. And just to be clear here, we never get to see the condition of the taillight when it's brought into the garage. When we do see the car, we see it after Brian Higgins, Chief Berkowitz, Michael Proctor, and Yuri Buchnik have all had access to it. At 5.36 p.m., the car pings that it's arrived in the Sally Port. That's during the missing video. Trooper Proctor, Trooper Buchnik never sees Brian Higgins' phone. They speak with him, and he takes it upon himself to use his own resources, Brian Higgins, within the federal government to ask a friend, Special Agent Mac Kelch, to download only the text messages in his phone between Karen and him and him and John. And that's it. We have to take his word for it that we got all of them. And we certainly don't have any communications between him and Brian Albert, for instance. On February 10th, when he shows up to his interview with troopers Buchnick and Proctor, he brings with him copies of the text that he has deemed relevant in their murder investigation. And he hands them the copies of the extraction that he had his friend do. He then calls Matt Kelch the weekend uh, of this uh, uh, incident uh, to do the limited extraction. He never tells uh, Trooper Buchnick or Trooper Prochner how he extracted the tests, uh, despite the fact that it was done by a friend of his in the federal government. Um, during the federal proffer, Brian Higgins admits that he had been served with a preservation order and the Commonwealth told him he could destroy his phone despite the order. He then drives to a military base on Cape Cod, opens his phone, breaks the SIM card, and throws the phone away. And he says that he discussed destroying his phone with Brian Albert. Brian Albert also destroyed his phone. And Brian Albert uh, said that he had uh, received some text that concerns him as an explanation. And after that, Brian Higgins changes his phone number and changes his cell carrier. In short, he was present that night. He had a motive and there is plenty of consciousness of guilt cover-up evidence with regard to Mr. Higgins. Moving on to Colin Albert. Shortly before January 29th of 2022, Colin Albert lived with his parents, Christopher Albert and Julie Albert, on John O'Keefe's street, just two doors down. We have evidence of bad blood between Colin Albert and John O'Keefe. We have evidence- how old, how old was Colin Albert at that time? I believe he was 16 at that time. Okay. We have evidence that Colin Albert and John O'Keefe used to get in confrontations because Colin Albert used to cut through his yard without permission and John O'Keefe was not happy about that. We have evidence that Colin Albert used to throw beer cans intentionally into John O'Keefe's bushes and John O'Keefe was not happy about that. We have evidence that Christopher and Julie Albert knew of this conflict. We have evidence that they referred to John O'Keefe as Nebercracker. That's a character from, a, I think, a kid's movie uh, who was known as the get-off-my-lawn guy. When John O'Keefe and Karen Reed were vacationing in Aruba over New Year's Eve 2022, the Alberts, Christopher and Julie, taunted him. They went to his porch and they had photos taken of themselves drinking on John's property when he wasn't there to do anything about it evidencing they knew how upset he was at what Colin Albert had been doing. Now, the investigators in this case, Your Honor, including Michael Proctor, kept Colin Albert's name completely out of the police report. When this case began, I had no idea who Colin Albert was. Um, I received a tip right from the jump 
that Brian Albert and his nephew had beaten up John O'Keefe. I didn't even know Brian o Albert had a nephew at that time. But after receiving the tip, I learned of the conflict that Colin Albert had with John O'Keefe, so I sent a letter to Mr. Lally, I believe by certified mail. I knew that the DA's office was planning to present evidence or witnesses to a grand jury, and at that early juncture, before anybody uh, had, been, had asked them to indict, um, I notified the DA of three potential suspects, the ones that I'm talking about now, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, and Colin Albert. Um, after he received that letter at our next court appearance, I'm sure Mr. Lally can confirm this, um, he acknowledged that both Brian Albert and Brian Higgins would be testifying or had testified before the grand jury, but he questioned why I included Colin Albert in my letter. He told me at the time that he had no evidence that Colin Albert was there that night. However, after receiving my letter, lo and behold, multiple witnesses testified that Colin Albert was at 34 Fairview the night of January 28th to 29th. And now the DA will argue, I'm sure, at trial that he left before Joan O'Keefe arrived. We don't find their evidence compelling. We don't accept it. We are not required to accept their theory of the case. We're entitled to present a defense. His presence at 34 Fairview gave him the opportunity, along with the motive, to harm John O'Keefe. With regard to Brian Albert, Your Honor, um, this is a well-connected, well-known, powerful family in the town of Canton, Massachusetts. Brian Albert was present at that home when Colin Albert was there. <coughs> Colin Albert is a member of the Albert family. He's nephew of Brian Albert. We have evidence that Brian Albert had expressed hostility toward John O'Keefe as well. And we know that he initiated a phone call with Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning. He reached out to Brian Higgins. And then he picked up the phone when Brian Higgins came back and they spoke for 22 seconds and they never revealed any of that to investigators again consciousness of guilt and perhaps most of all brian albert is a first responder he is duty bound to help somebody who's in trouble he was notified that john o'keefe was in trouble brian albert stayed in his home he knew what was going on outside. His sister-in-law was out there, civilians, medical personnel eventually arrived. He did nothing. That is also consciousness of guilt. Now, Your Honor, with regard to all of that third-party culprit evidence to admit it substantively, which I would assert to the court is, is both overwhelming and powerful, with regard to the Bowdoin uh, argument here, the police investigated none of that. That didn't come from the Commonwealth. They had a, a complete lack of curiosity as to what was going on in that house that night. They didn't care. Investigators never went in. The feds investigated, and that's where we got a majority of this evidence. So, you know, to, to the extent that the Commonwealth now claims that they didn't have notice of this, um, I, I beg to defer. They, they got notice of this when we got notice of this. Uh, you know, the Finney case, Your Honor, again, I'm, I'm well familiar with it. It stood for the proposition that, you, you know, if, if you want to point the finger at a third party culprit, you've got a constitutional right to do that. And if you want to point out inadequacies in a police investigation, you have a constitutional right to do that. Right? It's for those reasons that I ask you to deny the Commonwealth's motions. Okay, thank you. Any response, Mr. Lally? Uh, briefly, Your Honor. Just first, uh, again, what, what the case law requires is evidence and not just mere speculation, or saying that you have evidence is not actually evidence. Um, I, I do find it somewhat interesting that Mr. Yannetti uh, wrote apparently four and a half pages of notes but didn't have time to write a motion uh, to admit uh, the evidence uh, that he claims that he has. 
Um, your references in regard to uh, third-party culprit uh, Dr. Sheridan, uh, who indicated that the injuries are consistent with the fight. He's the same doctor who indicated that the injuries on uh, Mr. O'Keefe's arm were consistent with the dog bite, which was then refuted by the DNA findings from UC Davis, as well as the fact that the injuries are only on one side of the arm. And last time I checked, uh, dogs have teeth uh, on the top and the bottom, and there's no injuries to the bottom of Mr. O'Keefe's arm. Uh, furthermore, <clears throat> the Council references the federal grand jury materials in which uh, I would say, uh, as has been done numerous times previously, is, is severely mischaracterized as to what they actually contain. Uh, so what, uh, the, and it's not a crash reconstructionist as it's been alleged here before, it's a biomechanical engineer. Uh, and essentially what they did was take painstaking lengths uh, to go to, uh, to determine that uh, the defendant's vehicle did not strike uh, Mr. O'Keefe in the back of the head, which is simply something that no one has ever said, intimated at any point ever. Um, there is also a medical examiner uh, in the federal materials who concurs uh, completely with Dr. Scordy Bellow's uh, findings as it pertains uh, to the cause and manner of death. So with regard to each of these, the other thing that I would point out is, is counsel was uh, counsel record with the Finney case. The Finney case relates to third party culprit under the Bowdoin event. So it's not applicable to what counsel uh, was arguing. Um, it is a low standard, but it's also one that the defendant here has not met. It's not one without limits. Uh, as it pertains to much of, of the material uh, that it was uh, summarized uh, as far as uh, speculation as to what different things uh, counsel feels mean uh, from, from various uh, things regarding Mr. Higgins, uh, Colin Albert, and Ryan Albert, just starting with Colin Albert because that's frankly the easiest. He wasn't at the house, and that's what the federal materials confirm with each of every single of the witnesses that were spoken to by uh, the district attorney's office or the troopers or testified to the state grand jury. They testified to the exact same things in the federal grand jury, that Colin Albert had left the house prior to uh, the defendant and the victim arriving there, and there's absolutely nothing uh, to combat that whatsoever uh, other than, again, just rank speculation. So opportunity would be a little bit amiss uh, if he's not even there at the same time uh, as Mr. O'Keefe, regardless of, of the invalidity of any sort of uh, you know, ill feelings or ongoing feud uh, that's reported uh, from whatever unknown evidence uh, counsel claims to have. In regard to Mr. Higgins, uh, that, that, that was a fanciful story, but again, there's actually no actual evidence of, of most of those things, uh, or at least the, the imputations or the connotations uh, the council wants to put uh, behind uh, that. Um, whatever he feels, uh, things were observed. Um, so. Again, I'm not sure where the evidence uh, from this is coming from. Uh, what I'm also a little confused in regard to is that if counsel is merely relying on materials within the federal grand jury um, and just learned of them at that same time as, as we learned of them when uh, materials were provided pursuant to TUI, uh, then it's a little peculiar that the exact same arguments uh, were being made throughout the pendency of the case well, well, well before uh, counsel was provided with any of those uh, federal materials. Um, what counsel just went through is essentially a list of rank speculation and not actual evidence. Um, as far as the mysterious uh, portion that's missing uh, from the, the Sally Port. There's a number of different, it's, it's a motion activated camera for the most part. The other thing that I would uh, direct the court's attention to as it was contained within the state grand jury proceedings uh, is there is cruiser camera video from the Canton Police Cruisers. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from Cruiser 682. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from Cruiser 682 at 822 in the morning uh, when a lieutenant and sergeant from the Canton Police on their own go over to One Meadows Ave, which is the, the residence of Mr. O'Keefe, to do a well-being check because they had not received any information as to how the children were or if they were there being attended to. And they pull into the driveway. 
at 8.22 in the morning, directly behind the defendant's vehicle, which is exactly where Ms. McKay parked it when they stopped there to see if Mr. O'Keefe was there before then piling into Ms. Roberts' vehicle and proceeding to 34 Fairview. And what you can see within that cruiser camera video at 8.22 in the morning is the damage to the right rear taillight of the defendant's vehicle. Well before the defendant had then come back to the house after the hospital and then gotten in three separate cars with her family and driven in a blizzard all the way back to her parents' house in Dighton, and then the vehicle had then been towed from Dighton back to the Cannon Police Station uh, by the state police with the assistance of the Dighton police. Do you know what exhibit number that is before the grand jury? I believe it's 56, but I, I, I maybe I, I can certainly locate that information. And again, as far as Brian Albert is concerned, I, I heard nothing other than he's apparently in a well-connected family in Canton, and Colin is his nephew who wasn't present at the house when Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed were present at the house. So again, I think it's a stronger argument, certainly, if, if we're trying to bootstrap onto a Bowdoin defense, uh, and counsel will probably likely be allowed to uh, at least investigate that as far as impeachment, cross-examination, things of that nature, but there is absolutely nothing beyond just a, a fertile imagination and rank speculation as it applies to a third-party culprit defense. And for that reason, uh, the Commonwealth's motion to exclude it should be allowed. Right. The only thing I'd like to correct, Your Honor, is, well, or at least point out, is that, um, you know, the car pinged at 5.30. So hold, hold on until you get to the microphone. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the car pinged at 5.36 p.m., indicating that it was in the Sally Port. Um, there is an outdoor camera where you can see the car about to enter the, uh, the Sally Port at 5.31. Of course, you can't see the taillight in that outdoor, um, you know, camera. But Mr. Lally just argued before you, well, the reason why there's no, uh, you know, video of the car uh, between 5.08 and 5.50 is that it's motion activated. And I just ask the court to use common sense here that if the car's entering, and by the way, the car's there at 550 with a couple of people around it. When the, the camera comes back on, you see the car. So unless it was teleported in a split second so that the, the, the interior camera would not pick up motion, it drove into the Sally port. I believe that's the definition of motion and it should have been picked up according to Mr. Lally's own words. Okay, so when you walk away from the microphone, it's harder for the court reporter to hear you, Mr. Unetti. And I apologize, Judge. It, it's, um, you know, according to Mr. Lally's own words, it should have picked up the movement. Okay. All right, so I believe that's the last motion. So why don't we recess until 2 o'clock, and I'll see you back here at 2. Mr. Lally, will you have uh, Ms. Gilman, who I did see walk in here at one point, set up the screen oh, right where we normally keep it? Yes, sir. Thank you. You are muted.